Uh, he's got. You, his, said, you know, you're setting the stage for like this presentation, right? I'll say it with a lot of them. So. Okay, go ahead. Go. <laughs> Ready, go. He's got a his own agency out in Idaho Falls. It's mostly social media based. Um, and they just started the conference called RiseCon. They just started last year, right? Yep. And um, pretty much getting a bunch of business professionals together here in the southern, eastern Idaho region. And um, did you guys have 500 attendees? About 300. 300 attendees. So on the rise. Um, Touche. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he'll be uh, giving us a lot of information. To, and if you guys have any questions at the end, um, and feel free to come up and talk to him at the very end. But we should be going pretty much until 3 o'clock. So whatever you want to take away, whatever you want to do, is some source. Thanks. So. Appreciate it. What's happening? Well, that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody be brave, right? What's happening? Here to see you. Oh, yeah. Th thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So here's the deal. I'm a social media nut job. I love everything about it. I've studied it forever. So I'm here at your beck and call. I want to know what you want to know. Fair enough? So in the context of this presentation, if you want to scoot forward, you're welcome to. There's quite a few open spots here. If you want to be uncomfortable, make sure you have distance between each other. You can sit like you are. It's sort of cool. Whatever. <laughs> but here's the deal, right? I want to teach you what you want to know. So my backstory. I've been in the social media advertising world for seven years. I was, I was a social, I had a social media agency before Facebook ads even came out. Well, the real ad product came out before it was just a, it was a crapshoot at that point. I've learned it. I know it. I've taught it. I've been it. I've helped companies grow. Success, very successful companies grow because of it. Um, I go head to head with organizations out of San Francisco. Silicon Valley, Silicon Slopes, New York agencies, and we beat them every time. Might be a little bit arrogant. <laughs> Not really. No, I, we know what we know. We do a really good job of it. And so my job today, and when she asked me to come and speak today, I, I don't, I'm not here to throw any sort of an agenda. Like, I've got some cool information I can share with you about the psychology of how we go through the ad product. Or... We can have a dialogue about what's important to you right now, questions, and then we can kind of dialogue about, you know, back and forth, and I can give you insights that way. That's what I prefer. What do you prefer? How many of you have a question about social media? Okay, let's, let's start. So Shoot. I'm, I'm really curious about Facebook. Uh, do you think Instagram is going to overtake Facebook and paid social, or will Facebook remain the king? Paid social for like a few more years. Somebody That's a really good question. That's a really good question. What we're seeing statistically, I can tell you what my feelings are, right? What we're seeing statistically is marketers in today's environment are engaging more with Instagram ad product because they're lazy. And they're good. Meaning, the attention of consumers in today's market is shifting, right? What it used to be on Facebook heavy Facebook users is now shifting more towards Instagram. So to answer your question, it's a, it's a really good question, but it's a super deep question, right? Because you have to understand who the target demographic is. Now, you also have to understand and identify where the target demographic is shifting, what age dynamics are shifting into the Instagram ad play, and where companies are willing to spend who their target demographic is. Because I'll tell you right now, if, if, the demographic of the biggest spenders in the marketplace are on Instagram, Instagram will grow faster. If the demographic of Facebook users, of companies, is in the world of the Facebook ecosphere, Facebook will continue to be strong. So will it change? Yes, because attention is shifting. How fast, how quickly is really dependent on those companies that are willing to put ad dollars into the marketplace. So is, that, is that a fair yeah, statement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, listen, let me show you a real quick video before I dive into, into too much more. Hopefully this will set a little bit more of the context. This is a guy by the name of Gary Vaynerchuk. Does anybody know Gary Vaynerchuk here? Raise your hand if you're a Gary Vee fan. <laughs> Throws too many F-bombs out there, right? It's like, ah, oh, I can't listen to him. I really like the context. I've been following Gary Vee for about the last five years. I built my agency, our successful agency, on the back of his teachings. That's the reason I'm a fan. 
<laughs> Sorry, kind of tricky trying to pull on me here. Um, I'm a big fan. I'm not a fan of the way he, you know, uses the F word. This doesn't have any F words in it, I promise. I wouldn't do that. I'd probably never be able to come back here, right? Rather you'd be like, ah, no. <laughs> so let's see if this works. Before I give you my background, I want to set this up immediately, which is the following. No matter what you do in this room, no matter what business you come from, no matter what position you hold within that organization, whether you're a solo entrepreneur or work at a big organization, there's only one thing that bounds us all together in this room. The number one thing from a business perspective that ties all of us together in this room is quite simple. At the end of the day, before you tell me how great your SaaS product is, or your service, or how delicious your wine is, or how great you are if you're building your brand, no matter what, before you get a chance to tell me how great you are, or it is, or that is, you need somebody's attention. The number one thing that everybody here is battling on, the currency of business forever, and everything by the way, is attention. And the biggest thing that everybody in this room is being affected, and this is worldwide, whether I'm in Asia, South America, the US, obviously the you know apps are slightly different, the usage is different, but the one thing that is common, the one thing that I absolutely want to spend the majority of my time on is if you are sitting in this room and you do not understand the slide that I have up there that says I day trade attention and build businesses, you are very vulnerable in the speed of which the market is changing. If you do not understand that if you are religious or emotional of where you send your message, whether that is print or radio or television or conferences or direct mail or Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat or Tumblr, if you are emotional, if you draw lines in the sand, if you talk about how you used to do it or how your grandfather built the business or what is tried and true, in a 2017 world, you are massively vulnerable. Interesting perspective, right? Thoughts? What do you think? What do you think about attention? I'm not a professor, I promise. Like, let's talk. <laughs> let's have a conversation. I'm not preaching at you. Let's talk. Okay. So tell me, attention. How many of you work or have worked for an agency in the past? Done maybe an internship? Raise high. I'm going to get some context. Okay. What type of agencies have you worked with? Creative. Advertising, traditional, non-traditional, social, digital, more traditional. more traditional. Okay. Would you agree with that statement? To some extent, that that you're that no matter what, no matter what ad product, traditional or non-traditional, traditional, digital, that we're we're competing for attention. Yeah. Right. Competing for attention of the average consumer. Right. Who else has been an agency in an agency? I know you said you were. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Tell me your yeah. name, by the way. My name's Braylon. Right? Braylon. Braylon, cool name. Yeah. Alright, cool. Um, I work at Mel Luca. Well, I work at Mel Luca Network Marketing Agency. Uh huh. Um, and I'd say for sure, um, we're definitely competing for attention. Um, there's a lot of companies out there, and if that's what's on your mind all the time, which in network marketing, that's kind of what they shoot for. It's yeah. a long term relationship that you're trying to build with um, your independent contractors. If they're constantly thinking about that, if that's what their attention is focused on, and that's what we're going to be doing. That's right. It's going to be building money. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a different type of a business model, right? That's beat it. That's business to consumer more than it is business to business. It's a little bit different model, but in my mind, the direct to consumer model is more impactful in today's market than B2B. Because if we can as consumers can buy direct from a manufacturing company, it gives us the ability to control to some extent our buying behavior. Right? We don't have to go through a, a third party marked up product in order to buy direct. I mean, Amazon's basically doing it, right? They're bringing in a bunch of resellers of product. They're buying it from somewhere in the world, usually in Ch from China. They're marking it up at a small margin, selling it on Amazon. <laughs> As a result, they're, they're growing their margins significantly. It's a pretty wicked cool model. Affiliate marketing is a, is a crazy world. Yeah? So it actually has to do with, market, uh, with attention, but what's the best way for it's quite an obvious question, but what's the best way for a company to gain a relationship with a customer without making it seem like a chore? Great question. I'm going to show you something. So 
over the last little bit, so this was a presentation I actually did at a technology show, 500 plus people. I was talking specifically about the four simple steps of leveraging online attention or attention in general to capture the, the uh, increased revenue that you can capture from your existing clientele customer base, okay? So, did you know this? It's kind of a fun little statistic. In 2000, the average attention span was 12 seconds. 2013 was eight seconds. I can't imagine what it is right now. The average attention of a gold span, uh, attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. It's kind of crazy, right? So um, let me go to that diagram that kind of shares with you. Okay. So what you're asking me specifically is, how do I relate to a customer in a different way in order to retain and attract their attention so that they're willing to give a piece of their life or a piece of their financial resources to me so I can grow and scale my business more effectively. Is that, is that what you're asking me? Okay. So I believe, uh, how many of you have, have heard of Donald Miller? Okay, Building Your Story Brand, maybe you've read it, heard his podcast. Fantastic, fantastic book. Context is this. Characters, customers, we, target demographic of organizations, every day are looking for a couple different things, right? We have a problem. We go to the, we go to the food court and buy food because we're hungry. We have a problem. How do we decide on which place to eat for the day? Well, it really depends on three things. And I was talking, I met with the, what was the, who did I meet with? Well, yeah, we, like 10, we had 10 students. Anyway, there's a bunch of uh, marketing students, marketing sales marketing students that I met with. And we talked about this, but the reality is we as consumers struggle with, from a, from a pain point perspective, we are searching for one of three different types of pain points to buy products and services around. It's either an external pain point. I don't have shoes, I need shoes. Right? An internal pain point or a philosophical pain point. So let's talk about that, right? Marketing in today or previous to today, I would say probably the previous to maybe up to the last two years, there was this idea that if I push benefits out into the marketplace, if I sell my product according to the benefits associated with the product, I'll grow my revenue. Makes sense, right? If I have a need, an external need, if I need a pair of shoes, and someone tries to sell me a pair of shoes, I'm gonna buy a pair of shoes, right? Makes sense, it's, in, it's, it's today, it's forever, but there's a difference in understanding the internal perspective of a target demographic. Meaning, if we as consumers, yeah, I need shoes, but if I need a specific shoe for a specific purpose, and a, custom, and a company speaks to me based on really what I want a pair of shoes for, I know this is a terrible analogy, but hopefully it works, right? If I, if I have a specific reason why I want to buy those shoes, and someone's marketing to me based on that internal perspective, they've got my business. That makes sense? <laughs> you guys are a dead crowd. Like, let's talk. You can put your computers away if you want, unless you're taking notes. So what we have to understand in this process is that we as customers that are looking to buy something every single day, we're trying to fix a problem. Okay, we're trying to fix a problem that we have and the only way in today's market that you can really succeed in marketing is if you're meeting the internal, external, and philosophical pain points by creating, as a company, creating a marketing campaign that speaks to the internal pain points. It doesn't fix the problem. It's not a hero, but it guides you through a process that gives you direction so that you're the one that's in control of making that decision. I mean, look at the world that we live in, right? You have the internet at your fingertips where you can find out everything you want to about anything in the world. How many of you have done this? You walk into a store, you're going to go buy something, you have the product in your hand, you pull out your phone and you look at Amazon at the same time to see what the price is and see what the reviews are. We do it all the time, right? Why? Because you control the buying process. It's the hardest thing for businesses in today's environment to figure out. They're trying to figure out how do I control the attention of consumers, and they can't. So instead of trying to control the attention, you become the guide that builds a plan to help them get to the call to action 
to create success. So let's talk agencies. Who again? Tell me who's worked in. You've worked in an agency, right? What type of agency? Did you work in a digital agency at all? Yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit about campaigns, right? Talk to me a little bit about. Give me an example of a campaign that you worked on. Uh, well, I didn't really work on a campaign side. It's more like making brochures and stuff. Okay. Um, but so when you went through that process, tell me a little bit about how you created that. Um, so I thought about what the consumer is looking for. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I work. We did. Uh, we sold hunting trips or adventure trips. Okay. And so I think, what are they looking for when they're going on this trip? Are they looking for um, big quality animals? Are they just looking for something that's cheap? Are they looking for uh, just a good time with an outfitter that's exciting? So I, I thought about what they wanted. You know. So you're talking experience, right? What type of an experience can I display in this specific flyer or, or graphic, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was the outcome? The outcome of yeah, like what what did, what did you end up putting together? What was the, the content associated with it? What what did you finalize on? And was it su successful in way? Yeah, I I definitely think it was successful. Great. Um, but so I guess we would combine um, since we thought about the outfitter because that was important for a lot of the guys to right. go hunting. Um, we would include a little section about that and do as much as we could and show them pictures of what it would be like to be with them and we would show them like, hey, this is what your camp's gonna look like. This is awesome. You have a bathroom on a hunting trip, like isn't that amazing? And, uh, <laughs> so we would we would point out little things that we thought would grab their attention. And now, why, why do you think that? In my opinion, that's a great campaign because you're not selling the benefits per se of well, you can do this and you can do this and you can do this and you can do this, right? What did you create? Create an experience, right? That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, what is the difference? Great question. So we didn't talk about that in that meeting, did we? So what's the so she asked me the question, what's the difference between the internal problem and the, the philosophical problem? Well, in this context, the philosophical solution or the problem you're, you're, you're finding is everyone should have a good time while you're hunting. Oh. Right? Like philosophically, yeah, everybody should, that should work, or every, everybody should have a good time hunting. So while he's explaining that in the context of an experience, He's bringing out the philosophical pain, the philosophical pain point of, well, if I'm going to go do this, I should have a good time. That makes sense? So that's why there's a difference. The external, now, there's nothing wrong with putting some of the external content associated with that, but make sure the majority of the messaging meets that internal dynamic, which I think you said you did, right? Now, you could put the benefits of here's how many days, here's what it's going to cost, so on and so forth, but they don't care. Like, you as buyers, do you really shop on price in today's market? To some extent. But don't you want something that gives you the most value for the dollar you're going to spend? I have a good friend of mine. He owns uh, Idaho Mountain Trading down in Idaho Falls. If you, anybody who shop, shop there. He said, I've never seen more young people come and buy the $300 pair of boots in my life. Why? Well, you spend more because you want the quality. You want the value that's associated with the dollars you're spending. You don't care what the dynamic in terms of the external pain point is. You care about what's the ultimate intrinsic value that I capture as a result of the dollars that I'm trading for what I'm getting in return. Yeah? So it's a lot of that to do with like, psychology, like how they're thinking, like thinking about the like, cover of a book. It looks intriguing, so you want to read it. Um, Say it's basically the same thing in marketing. That, that's a fantastic question. I would say more often than not, marketing in today's environment is more about understanding the psychology of consumers than it is the type of campaign you put into the marketplace. How many professors are, we, are all the professors in the room? Would you agree with that? Disagree with that? What would you say? I think there's a lot to be said for it, especially as we sh as, as, and, and emphasis is put more on the content and in creating those experiences. I mean, I think that's why. It's, it's trying to get, trying to really kind of attack, or attack that, that psychographic behavior, what's really right. kind of going on. Yeah. Because, you know, listen, we buy, Amazon created this animal of training us to think that we need certain things subconsciously before we ever buy anything consciously. And it looks like this. Here it is. 
We have to trust the company, right? For brand awareness. If I don't know anything about Vans, why would I ever buy any shoes at Vans? Is that a Patagonia hat? This is going back to you. Oh, Patagonia shirt, yeah. yeah. If you didn't know anything about Patagonia, if you had no brand recognition associated with the company, would you ever buy, buy anything from them? I mean, I had to buy it first at one point, so sure. it was probably because someone I knew had it and liked it, or someone gave it to me and I had a good experience from it, and from then on I, yeah. I kept on buying it. Right. So value is established based on the recognition of a brand's connection to us as consumers. Make sense? Right? Now, second, yes, you can have fantastic brand awareness, but if you're not providing value for anyone, you're never going to sell another product in your life. That's a little bit of a bold statement, but there has to be intrinsic value in the connection of what you're spending versus what you're getting. Right? So the second component of that building value constitutes four E's, at least the way that I see it. We as consumers need one, if not two, maybe three, and if you get four, you're going to kill it. First one is education. If you can give someone who now has some established intrinsic value in terms of your brand, and I train and I give you more information about why Patagonia is incredible and why you should continue to shop with me as the marketing director of Patagonia, I'm not, but I'm just saying that I am in this situation, right? If I can continue to educate you on the quality and the, and the, the value you get from that product, are you going to give me more, give me more attention? Yeah. Sure. Now, if I can engage you in that process while creating the entertainment value of life shots and seeing people out doing really cool things, you're like, I want to be there, right? And then I entertain you. I think that's one I missed, right? If there's some element of entertainment, if you can capture one, two, three, or four of those in your campaigns when you're running campaigns in a digital marketing world, now, like the question that was asked earlier, well, how do I keep that attention? That's how you do it. Think about your own buying experience. Right? You might recognize a brand for a minute, but if they don't engage you, they're gone. Seven second attention span. We have to get into their minds. We have to, from a psychology perspective, understand where they're thinking, where they're going, and this is how it's established. Like, this is what Amazon did to you. What are the expectations when you're buying in today's market? You have to have content. You have to have the description of the product. You need to know all the specifications. You probably never look at it, but you have to know that they're there in case you want to look at it. Right? Is that fair? And then... The trust component is you have to know that someone else paved the path for you. Because if nobody else ever bought a Patagonia shirt and you never saw anyone else and there was no element of social proof associated with that shirt you're wearing right now, you never would have bought it. They say that if there was a study done at Northwest University that basically dictated that if you show social proof in the process of building brand equity, the close rate is 270% more likely to happen. Kind of cool, right? But yet, how many websites have you been to that they don't, even, they don't say anything about their Google reviews or a testimonial video? I mean, listen, I, I work in the agency world and I see it every single day. I'm working with an organization out of Arizona right now. It's like, we can't, we can't get conversions on social media. I look at it, I'm like, well, dude, you're going brand awareness, which really nobody even knows about you right now, trying to get to the acquisition. That's how traditional media has always worked. That's why traditional media is not working anymore, right? This element, just have a pointer. Oh, darn it. Maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? I call this section right here the friction zone, right? Because if you are not building this inside of your organization. I know I'm not talking to business owners right now. Maybe some of you are business owners. But as you're working in the, in the marketing world, if you're bypassing this component right here, and you're going brand awareness to acquisition, that's traditional marketing. Is traditional mar marketing working as effectively as it did before? It's not, right? So if you try to bypass this, just like my client in Arizona right now, he's been bypassing this for the last few weeks, and I'm begging him for content around this. I'm just saying, he's like, well, social media doesn't work. I'm like, well, yeah, it doesn't work because you're trying to use social media as a billboard. 
Who cares? How many of you would love to look at a billboard on Facebook or Instagram? <laughs> right? Nobody does. Like that's the that's the, how fast can you scroll past that content? Now, if you see a video that engages, how many of you guys have heard of Dude Perfect? Right? Isn't that all they did? Is they just didn't entertain you? They make millions of dollars a year because they did something pretty. I mean, it's pretty talented, I guess you could say. I'm sure they practiced a lot more than the actual video took. But they entertained you, and now they're making millions. Because why? Because they have your attention. The company with the most attention wins. Simply put. Whether that's traditional, you know, maybe your ad product needs to be a radio ad product that goes to the market that's their attention is in the ad product or is in the, is listening to radio. I don't know what company that might be or who's paying attention to radio anymore, but that might be the play. Okay? How many of you spend at least an hour or two on social media every day? Don't lie to me. Like, everybody should be raising their hands right now. Okay, cool. All right? So your attention's there. So if I'm a marketer trying to get in front of you all, where do I go? I don't go to a radio. How many of you listen to a radio out lately? You have. Pandora? No. Traditional NPR? Yeah. Okay. NPR is a market. That's great. It's, it's better than listening to all the other junk that's on the radio. Yeah, fantastic. It right? keeps me informed a little bit. Yeah, that's great. There is some great... Now, radio is fantastic. Podcasting right now is huge and it's growing fast. It's replacing the, video, the, the radio aspect because now you can control the experience, right? It's a fascinating psychology that we live in in terms of marketing. Hey, can you, did you hate that? You're like, oh, I should have turned my phone off. It's all good, I don't really care. Yeah. So if you're just starting up a company, how do you use testimonies and testimonials and reviews to build trust? You know, if you don't really have much experience in that, or much. Well, go, go create an experience. <laughs> okay. You gotta hustle for a little bit, right? You gotta go out and create that experience. Find somebody that you can sell to that will do it without having that, or do it for free for crying out loud, right? The way I started my agency is I did training, I did social media training for probably three years for free. Brought businesses in from all across the area. I did free training, showed them the value, showed them the value, provided value for three years straight before I ever asked for a penny in return. And why in the world would I do that? I mean, you gotta make money, right? Well, sure you do. But I can't establish myself as a, as a, a a person of value inside of the community if all I'm doing is asking for something directly when I'm doing, you know, I'm at, if I'm asking for, for money from someone, then the very first presentation doesn't provide any value. It's like a bait and switch, right? It's this. Is it not? It's going from here. Yeah, I might have built a little bit of value, but I still skipped the step here. I still, in my opinion, the most important step. So don't be afraid to do a little bit of work for free. Hustle, right? Get out and ask, say, listen, nobody's running your ads right now or, or doing digital media, running SEO pay-per-click. Let me just try it and get some experience. Of it. I mean, you guys have a great opportunity. Don't take any of my clients, but you have a great opportunity. <laughs> you have a great opportunity. If you, if, if, if you can capture work in this area and do it as an experiment to learn, do it. Like, do it. Like, that's where you're gonna get your best experience. The professors are gonna teach you great information but the application of knowledge is really where wisdom comes, right? It's not just in gaining information and hoping that something when you get out into the field works. Go learn something, go test it for yourself. Learn something in one of the classes that's being taught and then go try it. Figure a way to try it. You hear something cool, like, oh, I'm gonna go do that. Be cool. Okay, yeah. Well, I was actually gonna ask you, because I know Gary Vee is like a huge proponent about doing like free work, mm -hmm. at least for a good starting point. Sure. And I wanna know what your pitch was when you approached a company like, hey, I wanna do this free work. Can I give a few examples? But, yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like it is a good opportunity, especially in Rexford, but like if, you, if I were to come to you and to apply for a job or internship, mm -hmm. would you hold an internship more valuable though than free experience? 
but both still are experienced in the same like spot. Which one would you say is more valuable though? From the things that they can learn if they really apply themselves inside of what we're doing will pay them more than me paying them eight to ten to twelve bucks an hour to come and sit and do nothing, right? So in the last meeting I was talking a lot about hustle. Internships are a fantastic <laughs> way of getting experience if don't go take a director of marketing position if there's no marketing inside of the organization already. Right? Don't go and create the marketing division for someone. Because what type, what type of value, you're just guessing at that point. Find agencies, find organizations that you can mimic and learn from that are successful in the industry. Be willing to hustle a little bit, right, to learn that. Can you take and learn it yourself? Sure. But if, I, if you're going to go do that yourself, then find a mentor, someone that you can follow and engage with and connect with to make sure that what you're doing is working effectively. So, you know, if it's a Facebook ad product, go listen to Rick Mulready, The Art of Pay Traffic, right? Fantastic podcast. You know, find other people in the industry, Nick Kuzmich, Tim Bird. like, go find, I mean, that's how I learned. Do you think seven years ago they had any sort of curriculum around how to build Facebook ads? They didn't really have Facebook ads back then, right? So I dove in and I just, I learned, right? YouTube, there's a great place to go that you can probably love for, find anything about anyone and find the right type of leaders, it's called Google, right? Google.com. Now some of those have manipulated the rankings to get up higher. So just pay attention, test it. If you like what they're saying, then you know, follow it. Engage inside of their communities. Most organizations, most thought leaders, if you will, have some sort of a community, get in and dive into those communities and ask questions continuously. Right? You'll learn more by asking questions than you will by ever trying to do something. Pretty fun. You learn a lot. I still, I mean, I, I still engage in communities all the time because the, the ad products has changed so fast. Like what was working six months ago today, this still works, but the way you position the content in association with the different ad products and changes that they have in the ad product right now, they might be positioned a little differently to run a different type of an ad that's working more effectively. I wish I could control more of the algorithms on Facebook, but unfortunately I can't. Yeah. So we have to play their game. Did I answer your question? Yeah. 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 So when we're, when we're talking about doing free work for people and just getting our experience and everything, um, when you were doing the, that work for your clients, how did you make the transition and say, hey, you know, I've been doing this for you, now I'd like some money? How, how did those kind of conversations go? Just ask. If you provide enough value here, and you've built that social proof by proving what you're worth, then ask. It's not a hard conversation. Say, hey, listen, I've been doing this for free. You're seeing a return on investment for what, what I'm putting into it, and there's actually tangible data. Look at what I could do if you paid me. I could allocate more time, effort, and resources to it. Be free to ask. Business owners want to make more money, right? And if you show them how to make more money, some, I'm not sure in this market per se, but some will be willing to pay you for that value. There was this concept, there's all these Facebook ads going out about, well, you, you work for free and then you charge them afterwards, like this is how somebody grew to $10,000 a month in agency work and so yada, yada, yada. Don't bait and switch them. Like have a sincere interest in helping them succeed before you ever ask for something in return. Like, don't run it for one month and say, see, now pay me. Mm -hmm. Right? Build value. Talk, di have dialogue. Figure out brainstorming. Figure out, you know, how the whole brand story concept fills in and really engage in the process. The cool thing about you students sitting in the room today is you're smart. You're probably the most socially capable, in terms of social media, socially capable group that's ever come through this university. But you don't know anything about social media. Just because you use it, doesn't mean you know it. I'm not trying to be mean. <laughs> but I see you come into my office and I train you and it's like, oh man, right? We can teach you, but you have to be teachable. You have to be willing to dive in and learn yourself. I, I mean, Listen, we were, who was I talking to? Elena earlier was saying that there are social media jobs everywhere 
if you do a good job. If you can figure out how to get some real life experience, you're a, you're a hot item in today's market. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get paid $100,000 a year, but you have to start somewhere. But as you have the success, you can begin to grow that way. That make sense? Did I answer your question? Yep. Cool. What other questions do you have? Just tell me. Oh, we're still good. He's like dominating the conversation. I'm happy to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious because I don't have like the best knowledge about Facebook when it comes to like ad or campaign stuff. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend like certifications, like Facebook Blueprint? Yes, Is absolutely. Like a good route? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if you, so Facebook has a back end training system called Blueprint. How many of you have heard of that before? How many of you are certified in Facebook Blueprint currently? It's a process. But if you go through, I mean, listen, Facebook's not a secret. They're going to tell you everything that they're going to do and why they're going to do it. They're going to even teach you about the <laughs> algorithms and how the algorithms work. Like, go do your due diligence. Yeah, go, go all the way through Facebook Blueprint. I've done it. That's one of the things that we encourage our, you know, our, our interns and our employees to do is get a Facebook Blueprint certified. It's a long, tedious process. 75% of the information is new. 25% of it is not. If, you, if you're very kind of learning for the first time. There's some really good content there. Really good content. As a matter of fact, I might even make a suggestion to teach a whole class specifically on Facebook using Facebook Blueprint. It'd be a phenomenal class. Because they're not, I mean, they're not, they're not trying to hide anything. They want you to work with them. I wish they were a little more available to ask questions when your ad product doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> but they're not very good at that either. They don't care. They're taking your money and running anyway. Great question. Yeah, that's where I would start. How many of you are, I mean, I know we're in a marketing society, is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. How many of you are like digital marketing emphasis? You guys are probably bored with me talking about digital marketing. How, how many of you are in the world of, what other, what other majors are in the room? Yeah? I'm out of the engineering technology. Fantastic. It's a guy that's going to learn something. He's probably going to take something from today's presentation, maybe learn a little bit more. And when he goes into his profession, he's going to be that, that much further ahead. Right? Yeah? Graphic design. Graphic design. Design is important. It's extremely, extremely important. Yeah, great. What other professions? What other majors? Visual communication. Visual communications. Videography? Is that kind of uh, part of videography? No, it's more like, uh, it's kind of close to graphic design, uh, but with like image, like talk to me and stuff like that too. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Account. <laughs> Has it been kind of a crazy wild run, like being in a social media agency from an accounting perspective? It kind of has been, yeah. It's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Because we talk numbers all the time. Dang it. <laughs> we talk numbers all the time. We ask him, okay, let's do, let's run an analysis of how the ad product is working here based on what we have our benchmarks to be. And are we meeting those benchmarks based on the current ad product that's being established? Are we delivering to our end client exactly what they need? Now, here's another interesting dialogue that we just recently started talking about. In the advertising world, for the most part, in terms of growth for, for companies across the board, there's this concept of operational data. So, have you heard of like reach, impressions? How many of you have taken a statistical class from a... From a marketing perspective. Brother Eager, what's the name of the class that you teach? Isn't it a statistical analysis class of some sort? Um, we've, got a, we've got a couple of them that yep. the closest thing could probably be the, the marketing analysis class. Marketing analysis. And wasn't that one you were saying you really enjoyed? And that was consumer behavior. But oh, sorry. Someone else said that. Somebody said that in a meeting today, right? So taking data, proving the point that advertising works specifically through data is a good thing. But there's a missing component, it's something that we're working on as an agency, and that's what they call the experiential data. So there's this XO phenomenon, right? Operational data, we can prove, we can show, we can dictate, we can identify, and then you have this experiential data of what's really happening to the business. Listen, I can show you, I can give you leads, and I can show you everything from a digital marketing perspective on why your company should be growing. We've had conversations, though, that they're not growing. Well, why? So we're starting to ask that question, why? Is it 
is that the messaging is wrong, right? Part of the, the data here, but is it the experience that we're creating to really show growth of an organization? Or are we only isolating ourselves specifically to the statistics associated with the, pro the ad product being run? It's a fascinating, it's a psychology, right? It's a fascinating conversation that intertwines data and experience in a way that really shows business growth. How many of you ever heard of venture capital firms like buying startups and so on and so forth? Well, the way that I understand venture capitalism, and I'm not an expert on this by any means, we do a lot of acquisitions in our company, as a matter of fact, we're in the middle of another one right now. But what we've seen is that when a venture capital firm decides to invest money into an organization, they look at their profit and loss statement, for the most part. They see what are they doing currently inside of the O data that dictates me investing and getting a return on my investment. Well, and Gary Vee fans, right? What, what we've heard in the industry is that people are getting money hand over fist in the tech startup areas like Silicon Slope, Silicon Valley, Boise currently is another tech hotspot. They're getting all this money and the data is there, but the overall end product, the overall growth based on that investment is not there. Well, it's because it's the experiential data. It's like, really, what is the happiness level of a customer? People never really ask that question. Yeah, they send out a survey to say, how did we do, or give me five stars on Google, right? But are they really diving into the experience that consumers are having with the company, or are they just reporting all the operational data based on what they're seeing from a, from a product that's being run? It's a fascinating conversation. We've seen SaaS products all across the industry that's solely based on what are the metrics. Grow.com grow is growing extremely fast out of Utah. They're a huge organization that people use all across the country to show, prove, identify success of campaigns to clients that they're working with. We used it for a while. Databox is another one, HubSpot, right? All these organizations show the operational data, but they don't talk really that much about the experiential <coughs> data of is an organization growing based on the operational data, right? Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, um, well, just kind of in the back and stuff, I guess. What are some of the ways that you've seen that companies have built that trust for themselves as a social group rather than relying on third parties such as Grow.com or How, so you're, you're asking me, how has an organization, a company specifically, like an agency or, or a, a, just a company that an agency is working with? Yes, yeah, so for my company. So how, you're asking me, from a social proof perspective, how are people leveraging that? Well, I think you've all experienced these case studies, right? It's the experiential data, I'm sorry, the experiential data and the operational data combined into one proves that we validated the process and, and why people should work with our agency. Can I answer your question? Kind of, sort of? Keep going, ask, ask more questions. So if I understood you right, you're basically taking the case data and analyzing it and then showing the statistics on your website, or um, what do you do to really build, um, <laughs> sorry, it's like trying to put it into words. What do you do to build that just solid um, awareness that this is a, Social proof, yeah, exactly. right? So how do we build social proof is the question, right? You leverage the two above, the awareness, the value proposition of the four E's by giving them what they need. You incorporate successes that you've had in your organization, tie that in with the experiential component of how the company has actually grown based on the statistical information or based on the operational data, and that builds the social proof. And then you market that for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. You share that. You share, you share contact information so people can actually ask questions about the experiential data, right? Build transparency in the process. You're not hiding anything. Unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but fortunately, today's market, there's a lot of agencies. Let me, let me rephrase that. Unfortunately, in today's market, there are so many agencies doing work for companies that have no clue what they're doing. Like, what does it take to become a Facebook ad expert? Nothing. Just because I ran, I boosted a post one time, hey, I've run Facebook ads before. 
They have no clue that there's 17 different types of Facebook ad product. And you should use different ones in accordance with what the end goal is, what the result looks like, right? What does it take to be a search engine optimization person? The ability to type on a computer? I mean, there's a lot more to that, but in terms of qualifications and certifications and validations, Facebook Blueprint is one that says, hey, yeah, I did the work, but there's nothing that says, you have to go through this specific coursework and pass these types of tests to qualify. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, Social Media Examiner, which is a f fantastic reporting agency in terms of what's happening in the social media ecosphere, came out with a report for 2018 that indicated that marketing agencies as a whole, by, uh, um, there was a 7% decline in organizations that are focusing their efforts on Facebook as an ad product, and there was an influx in leveraging Instagram. And, and I, I mentioned this before. The reason, in my opinion, is because the Facebook ad product is getting harder. Well, it's supposed to. It can't always be easy, but they're shifting their attention to Instagram because they think Instagram is going to be easier. It's not. I look at it, um, and I'm really dating myself now. Like 2000, how many of you were even in high school, like in 2008, 9, 10-ish? Cool, I'm not that old. <laughs> right, 2008, 9, 10, what happened to the construction industry? Tank, right? People were like getting out of their houses because they were upside down, couldn't do anything with it. What happened to the companies that claimed that they could do good construction but really couldn't do construction? What happened to them? Anybody know? Yeah, right? They tanked. That's exactly what we're going through in terms of social media ad product today. Everybody jumped in and was a Facebook ads ex expert two years ago, but now they're like, oh, well, this Facebook stuff is hard, so I'm going to go to something else. And we're loving it because we're converting at higher levels than we ever have on Facebook because the market is shrinking in terms of the number of agencies. And it's causing competition. It's causing organizations to ask questions as if, are, is this agency actually working for me? Because now there's real success stories that are coming from the market. You've got about 75% of the market that's still engaged in wanting that conversation. The other 25% have had a terrible experience with a digital agency. And as a result, they say, digital marketing doesn't work for me. I shared this earlier. You know what happened in 2000, probably four, five, six with Amazon? Have you guys ever looked at that case study? It's kind of fascinating. 2004, five, and six, Amazon was nothing more than a book company, right? Do you know how they went from where they are to where, in 2004, 5, and 6 to where they are in 2019? They spent more money on Google Ads than any organization out there, at least that's what they, they, they claim. They spent more money on Google Ad product when it was extremely inexpensive with the long-term vision in mind that if we spend the money now, we'll benefit later. Not spend the money now, win right now, and all of a sudden, we, you know, if it doesn't work, we give up. They spent it for the last long time in what is Amazon today. It's a giant. They engaged in the process when it was cheap, which is exactly, in my opinion, where Facebook ad product is right now. Instagram ad product right now is cheap. If you can convince an owner to spend a little bit of money where you can reach 10,000 targeted people for every $100 you spend in ads in today's marketing world of Facebook and Instagram, if they engage long term and not just a 30 month, 30 day hit, in two, three, four, five years, they're going to be booming. All right? Social media is a long game. It's about building relationships, right? Building awareness, building value, building trust, and ultimately getting to that ask. How many of you have ever bought something the very first time you saw it? Mr. Patagonia, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Not usually, though, right? We have to have a certain number of touch points before we're willing to, to trust them enough, trust organizations enough to, to uh, really share our value with them, right? Other questions? So, Come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, Hold on. Yeah. Uh, so in what way, so do you guys create the content that you're posting for the companies or do the companies provide the content for you and you just manipulate how it's being? It can go both ways. It depends on the organization that we work with. We have a content creation division, graphic designers, 
videographers that can help storyboard and build a campaign out in terms of content, and that can be very impactful. Really what's most interesting is the micro-influencers, or, or what we call the non-traditional influencers, that have a followership, have a group of people that are engaging with them. They're not the 10 million, you know, Kylie Jenners, but they're the, they're the smaller micro-influencers that are impacting buying decisions because they already have these. If you click follow, excuse me, if you click follow on some, someone, it's because you're aware of who they were, you probably have some other friends that are following them, they created some sort of an experience that you want to follow them as well, and then when they say to buy something, you buy it, right? So this micro-influencer or this non-traditional influencer ecosphere is really what's coming to light right now in my mind. It's pretty cool. And, and you all can be a micro-influencer if you want to. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work, which is good. All right, back to your question. Great questions, by the way. For your company, do you guys focus primarily just on Facebook and Instagram, or do you guys go to YouTube and podcasting as well? You know, we, we stay in our lane, right? Gary Vee style, right? We, we know we're, we're good at 1% of the things in the marketplace. If we're not good at something and we want to have that as part of organization, we do it through acquisition. So we bought a web development company last year. Fantastic organization, now we do web, right? Um, we recognize that there's an opportunity to work with search engine optimization and pay-per-click advertising uh, organizations. We see that as competition, not that we're, we're doing the same thing, but the, the attention and the market dollars are the same. So we've decided to do a merger acquisition with a SEO pay-per-click advertising agency. So we're bringing the best of the industry in, we're not just hiring someone to come and do it. Does that make sense? Because yeah. most agencies, we actually did a big survey, the, the Research and Business Development Center up here, did a 13-week long assessment. They went out and they interviewed and they found data for us, collected data of how many agencies specialize in a specific thing versus a one-size-fits-all organization. And we realized, and, and looking at all the data associated with the one-size-fits-all organization is their client levels were not happy because they were good at two or three things, but they weren't good at the rest. So we decided strategically to grow by acquiring other highly qualified organizations to expand that reach and share the same ad dollars across the board. Yeah, because I'm curious, because I'm pretty sure clients probably were asking you, like, oh, can you do SEO? That's right. Well? Every single time, yeah. What about email marketing? Have you thought about acquiring an email marketing agency? Or it's, a, it's an extremely important thing to keep brand re uh, there's another. There's another thing that I was talking about, but it's not in this presentation. It helps with that continued brand awareness, but more importantly, there's a bottom one after the revenue. It's called retention. Build retention, right? Build a tribe. Um, that retention component is very well verified through email marketing. Email, email marketing open rates, so email open rates are 10 to 30 percent ish. The quality of email has to be personalized. So you're asking the question: Have you ever acquired email or thought about it? We thought it, we, we've considered it very highly in terms of really diving deep with email marketing campaigns. It's such an important part, and it's a part of our business we're missing currently. Yeah, for sure. Um, is it the most effective way of generating additional revenue for businesses? Again, I think every type of marketing you do can be a, a productive way of building revenue for an organization. It just depends on where the target is. And then, and then use the operational data, right? Use the open rates. See how many click-through, what your click-through ratio is to see what type of response you're getting. Build in back-end fun stuff like triggers that triggers an email if they click on a certain part of the email and you know, gives them, takes them down these, these uh, email flow journeys, right? But it, it's, it's extremely important, yeah. So would you say that it's um, generally beneficial to like specialize like in a specific niche and that like when you start to build outward just to find people who like are already good in those niches to bring in? Is that kind of like what you're saying? Or? That's how we've decided to grow our business model. And we found that it's worked more effectively than trying to train someone in-house that we don't even know much about. Like if I were to hire someone that does SEO that had a little bit of experience, I wouldn't really be able to train them on how to do it effectively. So instead of doing that, we just chose to acquire organizations. So um, I would say yes and no, right? It depends on the organization. If you can find the right person that's a, that's a complete expert, and you have the resources to pay someone to come in that can do that, it's not, it's not a bad deal, right? We've just decided to bring on the whole thing, <laughs> the whole 20 other people to make that work effectively for us, so it's a great question, yeah.
when you're starting your agency, like what would you do for like photography or graphic graphic design? So I kind of know Facebook ads how to like, target certain groups. Well, I'm not really good at like, photography or graphic design or anything. So do you like to take a few classes or look it up online? How to do that? Or What's your name? Ashley. Give with Ashley. <laughs> She's a graphic designer. Find people that do that, right? So find people that are on campus that do that. Figure out how to collaborate and work together. You know, she's never going to be cheaper than she is right now, <laughs> right? And she's going to realize how good she is. So utilize her. Give her the practice that she needs. Like if you can run ads, and you want to start a little bit of an agency. Say, let me name you, Ashley. Ashley. Say, hey Ashley, what if we kind of partner up on this little deal, and I I can run the ad product, you can do the creative. Do we have any content writers in the room? Darn it, kind of, sort of. Get with the content writer, right? Help them write the content. Do you have any videographers in the room? Oh yeah, right? So get with your, I mean, that's what this, in my mind, the society is all about. Like, connect with each other, right? Get to know each other, learn the, the skill sets that you have, find ways to just go out and chase some work for free and just get the experience. Because you as an ads person are gonna be valuable to an organization as long as they're willing to run ads. If you have a graphic designer that can help facilitate that and a videographer that can capture some really cool B-roll that can then be used inside of that product, then it makes you that much more effective. Right? That, is, is that kind of the purpose of why you're putting this together? Or no? No, that's all it is. That's great. So yeah, just get together. like Talk to each other. Learn from each other. Find out what your strengths and weaknesses are. Maybe you ought to do an activity around that. Figure out who's doing what and where. Right? I don't know. Or you can go to Fiverr.com. <laughs> you won't get the best product, but you know someone that's going through the graphic design program, go and figure out where they have classes and just kind of network with them, right? Go down to the communications building, wherever that is, and like just talk. Go to career fairs and go talk to people, you know? Like take their resume, see what they do, and figure out how to collaborate together. That's how I started my agency, my friends. I found a guy that I knew I could train to be really good at Facebook ads. He hustled, and I was like, I could turn you into a, a rock star, and now he's running his own agency. And he's probably killing, I don't know. Don't talk to him anymore. <laughs> he stole my clients, and I wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> no, no, no regrets, no, uh, no vendettas there. So, anyway, that's all. I mean, I hope this was helpful, guys. I, you know, you. There's lots of information here I could share with you. You're welcome to come ask me questions afterwards if you want to. So. Yeah, yeah. Can you get a round of applause for um, Real quick, guys. You do realize that he just came back from Boise Tech, and people probably paid to come and hear him speak. And we just all got to hear him speak for free. So thanks again for coming. Sure. I don't actually know if they paid to come. They did. But I'm just I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, my stomach is full. Take advantage of this. Um, make sure to come and ask any questions. Um, and then for next week, uh, Caleb, actually, run real quick announcement. Do you want to yeah. come talk about next week really quick? Perfect. So I know a lot of you have shown interest. We've mentioned it. We're going to be having a golf um, tournament and event. Not less tournament, more event. But um, we're going to start bring, bringing out flyers, handouts, and sign-up sheets for that. So if you guys do want to participate, we're having to put a cap on the number of students so spots could fill quickly. Um, we'll be handing out the flyers here. You can always come talk to me, message me on LinkedIn, Facebook, all of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, we're going to be getting that next week so that we can get going on that. At the um, beginning of July is when the event's going to be going on. So. If you're interested, talk to me and uh, be ready for a uh, handout and stuff next have week. Ever, have you ever used Eventbrite? No, I haven't. Use that. Eventbrite? Eventbrite.com, yeah. Okay. It'll, it'll help you with RSVPs. Oh, okay. Putting a cap on it and registrations, and then you don't have to have people fill out and track everything because you're going to have to put it into a computer eventually anyway. Eventbrite.com is good. So they do rise online? We build our own stuff. But event, it's, Eventbrite's fantastic. For, it's exactly what you're talking about. Okay, we do one other thing. Picture. Picture. Here's all about the picture. So it is. Well, yeah. Got to have some content. So you get to choose. <laughs>